Good afternoon. I'm Helen Rinsberg, president of the Cincinnati Asian Arts Society, cast to our friends. We're very happy today to present the talk by Dr. Ainsley M. Cameron, now in her fifth year at the Cincinnati Art Museum as curator of South Asian art, Islamic art, and antiquities. She completed her doctorate at the University of Oxford in 210, where her doctoral research focused on late 18th and early 19th century Rajasthani painting traditions. She also holds a master's from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London and a bachelor's in archeology span and history from the University of Toronto. Ainsley came to Cincinnati with extensive professional experience in curatorial practices, having previously held positions at institutions, including the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Victoria and Albert Museum, the British Museum, and the British Library. She has published, delivered lectures, and organized exhibitions exploring the courtly painting traditions and decorative arts of India, including a major exhibition and catalog project while at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, drawn from courtly India, the Conley Harris and Howard True Love Connection Collection. In Cameron's role at the Cincinnati Art Museum, she is responsible for the acquisition, research and display of the museum's South Asian, Near Eastern, Islamic and Antiquities collections. We are so lucky to have Ainsley here today because she led the development of the reinstallation of the ancient Middle Eastern galleries and a significant reinterpretation of this world-renowned collection. She'll illuminate behind-the-scenes curatorial process of this gallery transformation, as well as provide a sneak peek of the upcoming Arts of the Islamic World and South Asian art galleries. Ainsley, over to you. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, it is an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you to Helen, to Steve behind the scenes and to everyone on the board um, for arranging this talk and then to all of you for showing up as well. Um, I gather there is um, a football game today that's kind of important. So I'll make sure that we're done beforehand, but uh, I don't think there's gonna be much overlap between football and art here, but we'll see. I'll see if I can try to connect it. Let me just share my screen here. How does that look to everyone? You got it. Great. Awesome, thanks. Okay. So our initial plan for this lecture was, of course, to have it in person and to be in the gallery itself. You see a, a little picture in the center here on this slide of what the gallery looks like today. Um, but unfortunately, um, due to Omicron and ongoing lava with this pandemic, um, it is best that we that we do this virtually. Um, but I do hope that we have time uh, to gather again soon. And as soon as it's safe, um, Helen and I will find a time that we can offer for a in-person tour of these galleries as well for the members of CAS. Since we're not surrounded by the objects today in the gallery, I've taken the opportunity to make this a behind the scenes tour, a talk that explores the curatorial process and my approach in these galleries. I'm referring to it as the who, what, where, why, and when of museum work. Museums are in a moment of transition and have been for about 10 or 20 years now. We've moved from a model where the all-knowing and monolithic museum voice is slowly being replaced. Instead, museums are encouraging dialogue, creating space for emotional connection, and encouraging a critical engagement with collections. Part of this change is being transparent about the ways that objects are being discussed. There is no definitive way to display or discuss a museum object. Instead, there are a multitude of stories that we as curators can draw upon as we shape narrative. In respect of this mode of gallery presentation that we've created in the Ancient Middle East Gallery, I've designed this talk with room for discussion. So we're gonna have time at the end to ask questions, share responses, and offer your own engagement with the collection. 
In 2016, a team of academics and students at the Department of Classics at the University of Cincinnati, as well as Hebrew Union College, had been tapped to work collaboratively with the museum. It was my job to see that through. When I arrived at CAM in 2017, I was able to do what I referred to as a quick and dirty reinstallation of the gallery. It had fallen on hard times lately and desperately needed a refresh. So this is what I did, the pictures that you see on the screen here, with zero budget and about three months, as a way to explore some of the thematic groupings that were under consideration. Now we only had about 20 objects on display. Everything else was needed in conservation, for loan to the Met, or for research behind the scenes. I got a lot of comments on the green color that I painted the walls, but frankly, it was way better than the gray color that we had before. It was like a, a spotty lavender, if you will. So how did we get from a sparsely installed gallery to where we are today? What transpired was a four year project funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation that radically changed the way we experience ancient art at CAM, as well as altering the way that we see and use the space. From the beginning, we had a straightforward mission to arrange CAM's collections in a broadly chronological thematic display to explore the movement of iconography, religions, cultures, ideas, as well as material trade goods across cultures and empires. I'm calling this straightforward, but it wasn't easy. What we're attempting, what we were attempting, uh, required a great deal of research, of conceptual thinking and intuition. These are large and diverse collections in material, culture, meaning, and purpose that required consideration. Not only that, but there was zero room for error. It's very difficult to switch directions when installing hundreds of pounds of stone sculpture. An added complexity and indeed joy was that we engaged with the artist Shazia Sekunder to create a commission inspired by our collection. While Sekunder's own identity and family history connect with Pakistan rather than the area now described as the Middle East, her practice minds cultural influences and forms that play across this vast region. The commission was defined as a way to merge past and present of the gallery and to create connection. When I presented this commission to the museum uh, for acquisition and for consideration, I really had to ask for their trust. Shazia and I didn't really know what the commission would look like or even where it would be for some time, only that it would be colorful, thoughtful, and inspirational. We actually workshopped a few different uh, locations for the commission. We thought of maybe um, having it on the doorway around the gold doors leading out into the courtyard. At one point we discussed perhaps that she would create something that we'd suspend for the ceiling in front of um, the windows. So there was a lot of options that we had and that we were weighing um, the pros and cons for. I spent far too long making this silly little graph in PowerPoint uh, to offer a way of thinking about this reinstallation and indeed many museum projects more holistically. To accomplish a project of this scale, there are dozens of stakeholders and elements to consider. These include the architectural team that you're working with, the construction firm, our exhibition designer, as well as installation, mount making needs, conservation, um, either objects that need conservation, that need particular treatments, that need cleaning, that can't be on display for a variety of reasons, um, grants administration, fundraising, relationship building, docent engagement. I mean, the list goes on and on and on of different avenues and aspects of this project as it came together. Gone are the days of a curator seated in an ivory tower, laboring away at research. This project was more of a boots on the ground kind of affair. And so I'll explain a little bit more of that in this talk. Speaking of stakeholders, I'd like to introduce you to the core curatorial team. Julia Olson on the left, PhD student at Hebrew Union College, Trudy Gaba, curatorial assistant in my department, and Sarah Wenner, PhD student at UC's Department of Classic, and she's on the, on the right. Through generous funding from the Mellon Foundation, 
we were able to bring Julia and Sarah into the museum on a temporary basis to assist on the research and to learn more about the curatorial practice. As we embarked on our journey towards a new gallery, we started by looking in the rear view mirror. So the next few slides will take you on a journey of what this space, the Hannah Gallery, has looked like over the years. You'll see here on the left um, in the 1930s, it was full of our European collections. It was bright and light filled and was very sparsely installed, um, but a very different dynamic take on the gallery than, than it had been in, in, in later years. In the 40s, uh, this picture, these pictures are circa 1948. Uh, it had the South Asian and Islamic collections installed. Uh, it was encouraging to see um, the close looking at manuscript pages that occurred in the bottom right hand corner. I hope you can all see that of some, someone sitting on a chair looking at a table and you can see the, the objects are installed, I think, within the table in order to encourage that close looking. In the 50s, we have a radically different take on this, this particular space. We still have the Indian and Islamic collections, but you'll see here, it's much more enclosed. It's, um, I mean, these are black and white photos, but it's also a much darker, you can tell, installation. They covered up a lot of the windows. They use sort of heavier casework, a lot of graphics, very dominating graphics. Um, so a radically different take than, than what we've seen before, of course. In the 1960s, kind of similar to where we were in the 50s in that they used the sort of this heavy enclosed casework and still had some windows open, but um, still was, were using darker tones. The 1980s that you see on the left, um, Islamic and the ancient Middle Eastern collections are merged in this installation. I particularly adore uh, what they did to the clear story windows in this um, at this time, that sort of like perforated look above the top. I think that that, I mean, the Shazia commission is way better, but those are really interesting, I think, and ways to, to control and mitigate that light, but also still have it more present than it was afterwards. Um, the reference picture from the 2000s that you see on your right, uh, many of you probably remember, were quite familiar with. Um, I believe Anita Ellis led on that installation. Um, by the time I arrived in 2017, it had been dismantled quite a bit. A lot of the, um, the center pieces had been removed, um, but it still had this idea of the Islamic world was, was partly in this gallery and then partly in gallery 146. Um, so that's probably quite, quite familiar. Um, again, it took a very spacious take though on the space. So gone was the, the enclosed buildings that we saw from previous generations. As you can imagine, um, this gave us a lot to consider. We were attempting to install an internationally renowned collection into a space that felt disjointed from the surrounding galleries, that was dark and cold, literally and figuratively, and it had narrow entries opening up into these cavernous spaces. So you'll see this graph that the exhibition designer and I worked with that talked about some of the issues that we were playing with. You know, how do we address these behind the scenes as we plan our installation? We had these dark, cold floors, we have this like bubbly wall texture, if you remember, it had quite a presence. It was sort of um, like a stucco almost um, against the wall that changed the color quite drastically as you painted it. Um, the dwell time in this gallery was low. The temperature fluctuations were really intense because of the, the various doorways. We had low and high ceilings to contend with, and we had very light spaces and very dark niches underneath. Um, the sort of the drop ceiling. So you really had a lot going on architecturally to deal with before you even address the art and what you're trying to do with it. So these were spaces that didn't encourage a great deal of dwell time. I used to call this gallery the superhighway. And you see here on the left, we have, we sort of mapped out the visitor flow, the way that people engage with that spaces. And there was just this trajectory of like, get from the lobby, to the Eastern, um, the East Asian galleries and there's no reason. Um, and so that is what we really needed to disrupt, right? We needed to find ways to encourage a more meandering presence as people went through the galleries. So disrupting that visitor flow became a really, really important part of the project to us. So the way we were gonna do that to change those visitor flows was to achieve, um, was to achieve it by moving some of the access points and using transparent casework to improve our sight lines. 
And that's what became the basis for the gallery design as you see it today. This idea of transparency, of including glass, of having see-through areas, of a more layered display. So we're using the height of this two-story gallery and of creating strong sight lines. And that could be either through the architecture itself um, because this is a very grand space that you're walking into, um, but also through the placement of objects. And of course you see what happened there um, as you come in in the position of the shrine. The next part of the project included travel combined with quite a bit of internet research to explore some of the design options at our disposal. The British Museum's Hotang Gallery, so that's the arts of Asia, they have China on one side, China and Japan and Korea on one side, and then India and Southeast Asia on the other. Um, they shared a lot of, this space shared a lot of parallels with what we were dealing with uh, in the Hanna Gallery. You see a very sort of long hallway and then also these dead end spaces, these little niches that they had on either side. And so what I found visiting the newly reinstalled Hotan Gallery is that they had used these dead end spaces really, really effectively. They'd introduced a variety of finishes for warmth and they had used the spaces above cases uh, really effectively. So suddenly you had um, all these ways to transform space just in the design and finishes that you bring into the gallery. So we were really inspired by this. And while visiting galleries that, are, that we're visually drawn to, that we find very inspiring, it was equally important to locate images of galleries that we felt didn't deliver. So you see here on the left, um, the British Museum Gallery, the Wellcome Trust Gallery, which is a very sort of large imposing space. But when you sort of get to the nitty gritty of it, it's stark, it's cold. There's no main draw into the gallery other than the main sight line. There are sort of, um, ancillary cases on the sides of the main trajectory, but it's very difficult to encourage people to go back there because there's really no reason to do so. The finishes are too one note, they're too thin. It's, it's, um, it doesn't have that warmth and inviting atmosphere that we were trying to create. Um, likewise, the Museum of Islamic Art in Cairo, we found the gray, the introduction of the gray to be quite um, off-putting, um, but also the use of white was really interesting. They had a great flow between spaces. So we were finding ways to draw from, from uh, different ideas and to bring them together and to make them our own. Um, you see this gallery in uh, Florence, Italy in the bottom right. Um, we found we were excited about this punctuation of bright color and what that could add to potentially to a gallery. But we felt that having it inside the, case, the cases contrasted so much with the, the sort of one note that you had on the exterior that we found that to be you know, not quite what we were looking for either. So these are beautiful exhibition spaces, beautiful museums, but you know, going through these images and talking with the designers, we found things that we liked that we wanted to consider um, in our own iteration, but also quite a few things that we were moving away from. This is the first rendering that we received from an architectural firm for the gallery. It incorporated a lot of our wants and needs. There had these variable patterns of movement, there was open windows, there was new lighting, there was a variety of finishes and quite a lively color palette. And we thought this was really, really exciting. One thing that didn't sit well, however, was the placement of this main shrine. It was certainly prominently placed, but it lacked any sort of architectural context through which to ground a visitor's understanding. Our attention then turned to this Nabataean shrine, the largest and most architecturally complete fragment from Kerbet et Tanur, a Nabataean temple located along an ancient trade route in Jordan. The Kerbet et Tanur fragments are the centerpiece of the museum's exceptional holdings that represent the Nabataeans, the peoples who built and inhabited the rock-cut city of Petra and created several other outposts across Jordan as well as further afield. The Nabataean architectural program integrates botanical elements attesting to their mastery of water in an arid environment, as well as elements from neighboring civilizations that creates a unique visual repertoire. The Tanur fragments in their current life as objects at the museum reveal a great deal about the Nabataeans. And yet they also reveal a fascinating history of early 20th century archeological practice, histories of collecting more broadly and the economic and political effects of colonialism. The shrine also highlights uh, the role of several individuals. The site was dug in 1937 by Cincinnatian Dr. Nelson Glick, working in collaboration with the Department of Antiquities of Transjordan. 
Half of the excavated materials were accessioned by the museum in 1939, and the rest can be seen prominently displayed in Amman. This makes Cam the honored steward for the largest collection of Nabataean material outside of Jordan. The collection has since been studied and published by many scholars across Jordan, Europe, and the United States. All of this combines to mean that our display should reflect the original context of the temple, a history of the Nabataeans, a history of why and how Cincinnati is part of that story, and the robust scholarship of the past decades. So displaying the shrine in this gallery was not a task to be taken lightly. Um, Sarah, the, one of the curatorial fellows on this project and I had the pleasure to visit the site in January 2020 to document the site, to visit museums in Oman and Petra, and to meet with many of our colleagues there. And I'm showing you here only pictures from our day spent at Tanor instead of the entire trip, as it really was an incredible, incredible experience to visit this site, um, to walk up the hill, literally. Um, it doesn't look nearly as tall as it really is in this picture, I must say. This was quite a hike and it was really quite vertical. Um, but to get to the top and to see some of the remains and to see and understand um, the site and the layout of the different rooms of this temple, um, it was really mind blowing and expanding. So it was a, a really great opportunity to be able to integrate that. Um, and I mean, thinking of where we are today in 2022, we took this trip in January, 2020. So, you know, this was my last research trip abroad um, before the onset of COVID. So I am um, very, very happy that we managed to, to squeeze this in before everything that's happened since. So thinking about the monumentality of architecture, the monumentality of the Nabataean civilization, the importance that we wanted to convey, we started to workshop ways to strengthen the architectural context of these objects in our gallery display. We wanted to be transparent that these sculptures are fragments of a larger whole, and we worked to find ways to visually communicate that more effectively in the gallery. This was our first attempt to piece together objects associated with the shrine, combining what I refer to as curatorial practice with curatorial craft activities. We're really just like cutting out little, you know, pictures of objects and sticking them to these larger drawings. The goal of the exercise was to create an exhibition graphic that included the details of the architectural surround punctuated with other fragments of the collection. So soon I had our graphic designer very excited about the prospect and we set about coming up with a plan. I was inspired personally by the work of Ratan Barman. He's a South Asian architect turned artist. And I sh I'm showing you a picture of his work here on the left. He uses the presence and absence of architecture and architectural forms in his artistic rendering. So you can see here, he uses this, um, these thin metal um, outlines of forms to communicate this grandiose and, and monumentality of architecture. So I was inspired by that of like, how can we address presence and absence? How can we address the fragmentary nature within our exhibition graphic? So this is where we ended up, um, a pared down iconography of the stones that was created in laser cut and painted resin attached to the wall. Uh, the interior is a vinyl that's adhered to the wall to give a greater sense of depth. Um, what I find really interesting about this too is um, originally we thought about trying metal. You know, what could we do? Could we have metal offset from the wall? Um, and that was our first brush of uh, COVID supply shortages. There was a massive steel shortage. We weren't able to, to access any of it. So we quickly pivoted and found in other ways to create this graphic um, in really meaningful ways. And I, I love where we ended up actually more than had we stuck with metal. What I like about this image too, is that it shows you the shrine, or excuse me, shows you the graphic before the shrine is installed um, and also shows how um, strategically all those punctuated parts are, right? That the graphic sort of stops, there's a, there's a space, there's absence, and that's where we inserted steel frame and um, uh, fragments into those spaces. So our next gallery rendering positioned the shrine along the back wall of the gallery, moving the doorways to either side to encourage a more natural flow pattern. 
and the gallery has only been open, what, a month and a couple of weeks or so. Um, but already, I can't really remember what the gallery looked like without those doorways. It just makes so much more sense to have visitors flow into those um, back galleries on the side as opposed to directly through the center. Other changes that we've talked about includes this transparency and casework, uh, the windows, opening the windows, and another doorway that we moved was that we moved the doorway um, from the courtyard coming into the space. Uh, instead of having it dump straight into the center of the gallery, we moved it so that you would enter from the right. So you would encourage that meandering feel as you enter the space. So now that we had a rendering that worked, we turned to laying out the rest of the objects in the gallery. We had three main themes that progress across the space and the placement of freestanding cases encouraged those themes to be more integrated. Through this thematic integrated approach, the entwined histories of Nabatea, Assyria, Achaemenid, and other ancient empires become visible in the use and reuse of iconographic forms, objects imbued with dedicatory function and symbols of power that traverse geographic and political boundaries. Representing complex political, religious, economic, and cultural connections across a vast network of empires and city-states yields important insights into these expansive cultures. And those are different insights than can be gained by viewing each color in, excuse me, each culture in isolation. Laying out the gallery at this stage was a surprisingly organic experience, uh, which gave me confidence that A, everything would fit, and B, that it would all make sense. You can be the judge of that. <laughs> the next stage uh, was construction. This was a very long and involved process, especially since COVID provided multiple surprises for us. Uh, we fell victim yet again to the global supply shortage, and this was long before it was talked about on the news. We had to wait over 10 months for new windows to be delivered, for example. The steel shortage caught us off guard. Um, shortage of individuals working in the construction uh, firm. All of these things have sort of impacted our timelines and continue to impact our timelines in these projects. And that's, that's a real pressure point um, that we're continuing to deal with. What I love too, is that, you know, we found, um, you find different spaces, you find, you know, above the center case um, in that center niche, there's an open space above it, you know? So one day I get a call from the construction company saying, do you want to put any art up there? We've got this big open space and you know, let's make it, we can make it sturdy, we can make it secure. So then I, I run through the, the object checklist and see, oh, is there anything that I want to have mounted at a high level? Is there anything that would make sense above these, above these center cases and these niches? Um, in the end, we decide to close them up, but it was this great moment to really think strategically and on my feet of, you know, how can we, how can we work with this, with this boom, with this game? I really liked this part, I'll admit it. I thought um, working with the construction firm and the architectural firm um, and giving hard hat tours and just being in that space when it was in that transitory nature, um, it, was, it was really, really inspiring. So shout out to large scale construction projects and they give you your own hard hat, a lot of fun. So there are these, three main sections of display in the new gallery. And this is what we focused on as construction continued. We needed to pin down our narrative, pin down our object list and our interpretive approaches. So we have our three main thematic sections and I describe them as the interconnected empires and symbols of power, curvet at Tanur and the Nabataean civilization and boring iconography to authenticate power. And then we have all these sub themes. And these are really, I think, connecting threads that um, allow our main themes to be felt more broadly across the different cultures and the different empires that we're representing. So we include the power of iconography there, the use of animal imagery, reinserting the female form. And I'll return to that one later in this talk. Alternative expressions of power, and you see those in architecture and writing, the ongoing lives of objects and continuing research, trade and exchange, portable objects, and the adoption and adaption of iconography. The first section we encounter in the gallery explores how territory in the ancient world was constantly in flux. Land that was delineated by trade routes would shift and change as empires would rise and fall in political prominence. 
This section explores how artwork representative of these vast territories illuminate centuries of trade and exchange and how that impact the region's cultural legacy. These histories become visible in the use and reuse of symbols of power that traverse geographic and political boundaries. Our interpretation of Persepolis focuses on the use of ornamentation and the multiplicity of form to communicate power through architecture. Similarly, in a section on animal imagery, this bull writing explores the use of bull as an image of power where the user can channel the physical strength of the beast. Much of the gallery focuses on the Nabataean since it truly is the strength of the collection. The objects shown on the right explore the symbolism inherent in Nabataean architecture through fragmentary remains. These include nods to Greek, Roman, and Parthian architectural styles, astrological deities, and ritual practices. And then the perfume jug and small dish on the left speak to a cultivated and cosmopolitan identity that was communicated to a wider world through trade to reinforce the Nabataean economic and political position. Luxury goods, such as incense and perfume, position the Nabataean civilization as a significant figure in the Eastern Mediterranean trade networks. With a steady stream of income, the Nabataean kings and queens created a built environment that reinforced their flourishing economy through beautiful, ornate foliate forms. These forms represented lush landscapes while also asserting a strong religious lineage. So the work seen here and in the gallery suggests to people sensitive to beauty and adept at using material culture to communicate power. Our third section connects the earlier empires of the ancient Middle East to the later Islamic dynasties of this geographic region through the use and reuse of imagery. Objects, particular, particularly portable ones, acted as a means of propaganda through their wide circulation. Portraiture acted as a symbol of authority while also linking the rulers to a long succession and demonstrating enduring imperial fortitude. This was a visual language meant to create and sustain power. The horse and rider motif is one that communicates longevity, adaptability, continuity, and power. The motif could represent a king or warrior most often, but it could even be a citizen. This fluidity of form allowed many to adapt the motif and to harness the power associated with the image. As further insight into the curatorial process, I offer you this slide, where we're laying out a case in storage. Working with the preparators in storage was incredibly important. It allowed us to identify the mount needs for each object, including ways to anchor small stone pieces to the backboard, choosing plinth height, and creating small feet for objects to rest in securely when on display. It also gave us a sense of order to the case, so that our written labels could flow from left to right or top to bottom in intuitive ways. A crucial objective of the project team was to create multiple meaningful entry points into the art of the ancient world, to explore the interconnected nature of these civilizations and to encourage new ways of seeing and understanding culture. And so at this stage, we were also working on our interpretive approach more broadly. Which objects should receive individual labels but also think through what other ways we wanted to communicate information. A few examples seen here include the wing, winged genie from Assyria. It was important to the team to communicate that the winged genie was an imposing figure, that the monumentality of architecture and the over life-size stature of this form was integral to its placement and understanding within its original context. Instead of relying on text or contextual images, we incorporated a nine foot tall graphic into the gallery. Visitors are greeted by the whole figure and can begin to visualize the Assyrian figure as originally intended. And I will say this was, you know, long drawn out conversations with our installation team and with conservation and with exhibition design, because I was saying, I wanna mount this much higher than typical height in a museum. I don't want people to be able to see it straight on. I want them to, to look up. I want them to have that feeling of monumentality and of a very, very tall imposing figure. So I was creating this connection through the placement of the object itself. At the other end of the spectrum, we had several coins and small seals to display. I jest, but I, it's very difficult to make coins look interesting. Typical approaches use magnification, screens, or other external devices. 
We ended up instead with these simplified drawings positioned near the coin to communicate iconography. Same again for the seals, but we repeated the figures to communicate that the piece would have been rolled in use. We also incorporated digital interpretive elements into the gallery. Our interactive map offers a deep dive on 32 of the objects on display. That includes a variety of historical photographs, archeological site photography, comparable objects in other collections, and much more. We were cognizant of creating digital content that worked well within the medium, as opposed to the bells and whistles, games, and spectacle that you often find on digital devices. It takes an inordinate amount of time to create this digital content, so please spend some time with this map when you're in gallery. We also created a fly-through of Kerbetet Tenor that's on a small screen positioned near the shrine. This allowed us another way to communicate the fragmentary nature of our collection. Pieces are slotted into the recreated temple space to give a sense of what, the grand of what a grand building it once was. The temple was leveled in 363 by an earthquake, so our fly-through is based on the research of Dr. Nelson Glick and Dr. Judith McKenzie, among others. Finally, a theme that winds its way through the gallery, as well as the hearts and minds of the core curatorial team, was that of feminine form. Throughout the gallery, objects that address the female presence, or lack thereof, in the ancient world are highlighted. Historically, the significance of women in the ancient world has been viewed as a function of procreation and the utility of women's bodies within the domestic space. And yet, women were active participants in empire, pivotal players in a political world and integral to ritual practice. On the right here, I offer the fragmentary remains of the main female cult deity at Kerbetet Tanur. Her body and confirmed identity are unknown to us today. Our project consciously reinserted the feminine into conversations of power, of ritual, and of empire. So that's also where the commission from Shazia Sikandar comes in, to ground the visitor experience in the ancient world in contemporary understanding. This monumental commissioned artwork occupies the clear story windows across both sides of the gallery, creating dynamic conversations with the ancient objects on view. Sikandar's practice mines cultural influences and forms that explore issues of gender, power, race, religion, and culture. Her thoughtful response to the museum's collection unites past and presence in one physical space, connecting hybrid influences and disparate periods in visually imaginative and awe-inspiring ways. We have lush depictions of natural forms and abstracted figural representations that refract forms explored across the gallery. So some of these include the rosette form that you see on the top, um, the top image on this, um, on this slide. Those rosette forms come directly out of the shrine itself and Nabataean architectural forms. A lot of the flowing abstracted floral imagery you can see connecting to some of those pieces. And then the, the figural representation, right? Like that's talking about reinserting feminine. She is literally doing that within this space. So we don't have the the goddess. We don't have the main cult deity at Kerbetet Tenor, but we have this ability to reinsert her form through alternate ways and functions. So by incorporating a contemporary commission into the ancient galleries, we're encouraging multiple ways of seeing, reading, and understanding cultures. The next three slides I sh I'll show you are just a few shots of the gallery that captures this idea of past and presence within the space. So you can see here this sort of like direct connection between the shrine itself and one of these works um, and the rosettes on the extreme left side that she's created within this window. Here we have a few objects sort of photographed artistically, um, but also showing that connection across space. sort of main view that you have. And on the left um, above the center case, you see a piece that is done in more sort of red and maroon colors. Um, that's almost a direct relation to a finial standard, a lower stand finial standard that you see in a case um, to the left of, of this image. 
please save the date and join us on the 31st of March and the 1st of April when we'll be hosting a symposium with invited speakers from across the US, Europe, and the Middle East to celebrate these galleries. The scholarship presented will explore new ways of thinking and presenting ancient cultures today. Topics will include archeology span and cultural heritage, the interdisciplinary nature of museum work, and the role of civic engagement to amplify the arts in Cincinnati. And so if you're a member of the museum, you'll be getting um, the postcard that advertises this in um, just a few weeks. When we started this project in 2017, I was only supposed to reinstall the ancient Middle East gallery. The rest of the suite of galleries um, that I care for were to remain as is for a few more years. Because of a combination of factors, the construction remit for the ancient gallery that broke through walls into the Islamic gallery, this of course necessitated a refresh, um, as well as the generosity of several donors who, um, who stepped up and said, you know, we really want to see these galleries deserve that, you know, they deserve the same attention. These collections deserve the same attention as the ancient galleries. So we had suddenly the opportunity to work on them as well. Um, so I'm currently working on the interpretation and display for the arts of the Islamic world and the art and architecture of South Asia galleries. These projects are still very much in development, but I've promised a sneak peek here. There are some construction changes to these spaces, uh, but most of the visible changes will be in the interpretation, the object placement and the gallery finishes. So gallery finishes includes the casework um, as well as the paint colors on the wall. I offer you here a look at some of these finishes um, because we're incorporating these really rich jewel tones that I think are gonna do wonders for our objects. Choosing gallery colors is very different from choosing colors for your home. You can be more experimental, you can be bolder, um, as long as the end result is secondary to the visual impact of the object you display. Um, so I'm really excited about where we ended up um, with these colors. Um, jewel tones, I think, just work really, really well with the variety of materials that we're gonna show with paintings, with ceramics, with stone. Um, with, it's really hard to find one color that works with all of those. Um, but I'm also excited that we've, we've moved away from um, sort of the, the typical color palette um, that you can sometimes fall into, like blues and cobalts look really good um, with the Islamic collections and draws out some of the pigments from ceramics, but that's sort of the color, right? In the Islamic gallery, if you go to a lot of museums, an Islamic gallery will have these rich blue walls. Uh, similarly, um, reds and yellows, saffrons are, are seen in South Asian galleries. So I was very consciously moving away from typical color palettes, but finding really, really rich, beautiful tones to land on. Gallery 146 is our Arts of the Islamic World Gallery, and it will also be reinstalled thematically. Our holdings of art represented, representative of the Islamic world include examples of calligraphy, ceramics, paintings, carpets, and architectural forms. By exploring this range of material thematically, we aim to create new visual and interpretive dialogues that forefront, excuse me, forefront the plurality and richness of Islamic artistic expression that spans centuries and geographic boundaries. Themes that we've developed include the art of writing, where Quranic folios, Persian manuscript paintings, Tarazi textile fragments, and medieval Iranian lusterware will be placed in conversation with contemporary works that explore the continuing importance of the calligraphic arts. Another theme will explore the movement of people, of objects and techniques across the greater Islamic cultural world, highlighting our holdings, for example, of hispano moresque ceramics. Here, visitors will cultivate an understanding of artistic and cultural exchanges that are reflected across continents. A third, theme that, a third theme that developed out of our gallery research is that of the 20th century practice of procuring and collecting ceramics in the Midwest. We'll explore the coveted aesthetics of the period, as well as the restoration practices of the time, while also demonstrating how and where the collection continues to grow. And I want to remind everyone here that it was through the generosity of the Cincinnati Asian Art Society that I was able to bring Dr. Margaret Graves from Indiana University into this project. Her work cataloging and tracing 20th century collections across Iran, Europe, and the US is fascinating and was absolutely an influence in, in what we're trying to accomplish in this section. The Art and Architecture of South Asia Gallery will incorporate paintings, decorative arts, 
domestic devotional objects, and temple processional and architectural fragments. The overarching aim here is to explore the multiple interconnected religious and cultural identities prevalent in the region. Arranged thematically, ideas to be explored include the art of devotion, where we'll address the visual culture of religious practice in Hindu, Jain, and Buddhist practices. Court and empire, another theme, will address the symbols of power inherent in everyday objects of the many courts of North India. A third prominent theme will be called Global South Asia, where we'll interrelate objects that date from the 17th through the 21st century. By focusing this part of the gallery on works that create cross-cultural connections, we have the opportunity to expand our historic South Asian narrative and address colonialism, modernism, and the present. I think a few of you on this call will be pleased to learn that the Jain Shrine will return to display. This will allow us to explore this exquisite example of domestic worship alongside other smaller devotional bronzes to offer a more robust understanding of the importance of devotional imagery across multiple regions in South Asia. So you'll see here um, a picture actually that was just taken this Friday afternoon that the Jane Shrine is um, in pieces all over our conservation studio and Kelly Rechtenwald, our amazing um, object conservator is starting to clean and do treatments on this piece so that it can be installed in the gallery. My final two slides are a teaser for a project that I'm in the midst of creating. In 2020, I fell head over heels in love with this monumental stone inlay piece by the Lahore-based artist Hamra Abbas. It was created as a site-specific installation in art and in Dubai at Art Dubai. Abbas's artistic practice draws from a myriad of influences and takes a diversity of forms. Her works originate from encounters and experiences that are manipulated by the artist by transforming scale, function, and medium. And when you think about transforming scale, if you look closely, those are people walking on this piece. So this was a giant floor installation that people were encouraged to walk upon. She works in paper, stone, marble, metal. She is unrestrained by subject matter or media. And she addresses notions of cultural history, sexuality, violence, ornamentation, devotion, and faith in her works. This work, called The Garden, references Mughal garden landscapes, the afterlife, and the ideal, amongst other grand ideas. I've been working with this artist to create a smaller wall-hung piece that plays off of these and other ideals, one that references the cross-cultural nature of artistic expression in Greater South Asia and how ideas, people, and techniques traveled. The piece she's working on, seen here in her initial drawing, then with some cut stone placed on top, explores the mountainous regions of Pakistan, Afghanistan, and India, where many of these materials are sourced to create a sort of dystopian garden ideal. Stones in a variety of greens, yellows, and reds will fuse together to create a landscape that forefronts beauty and perfection, ideas of the garden against this more rocky terrain. So more on this um, as the project progresses, but I just wanted to introduce you to watch this space as well. There's gonna be another um, incredible commission coming your way. Um, and as usual, it's gonna be a rather busy year for the department, um, but I look forward to welcoming all of you into the museum again soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ainsley. That's um, we docents have been talking. I, I, I told Ainsley this once before, but for everybody else, we docents uh, that I've been in contact with are just like over the moon with the, the reinstallation of the gallery and um, are itching to take people through it um, when we can when we can have um, tours again, which are on hold again for now. So let me call up the uh, chat window which, why did it disappear from my screen? Okay. All right. Well, we have Diane's to begin with. So um, if you could address more Shikander's um, intentions, I believe is what Diane wanted and motivations on that one. 
Sure. Yeah. So I tried to weave that into, um, you know, since I'd heard Diane's question at the beginning, I tried to weave that into some of what I said about the commission and pointed out particular um, elements from the shrine, as well as other works on display that I felt um, she was drawing on. You know, she literally had all of these images, pictures of our collection, and she was working from the images themselves. Um, so Diane, I don't know if you want to, um, did I address an, uh, enough of that? Or, I mean, really what we should do is just go into the gallery one day and I can say, this comes from this, this from here. Yeah. Well, Diane is muted right now. Um, I know one thing, Ainsley, that as I've studied those, there was a piece in Women's Breaking Boundaries by her. And it was a female torso, but the head, the hands and the feet were distorted. And I had an amazing tour with a group of women from uh, Ali. And we stood there and we looked at it and all of a sudden we're like, the powerlessness of women, you know, she doesn't have feet, how can she travel? She doesn't have hands, how can she, you know, manipulate anything? And there's hardly a head there, so she's not expected to speak. And we just all just had this, and I could see part of that in, in one of the images that you showed, the feet. It always made me look at the, the beater things that you use for making eggs, um, which was another thing that somebody said, well, it looks like she's only a kitchen implement, um, which was pretty astonishing. By the time we had that finished that discussion, we were just all over that piece. And I had to move the group on to the next, um, you know, stop. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. I think all of those ideas is, is what she's referencing, right? Is that this, this powerfulness, this removal of it, the sort of um, the disjuncture of her as a, as a woman, right? Part of it is that she made that piece um, um, in 1993 when she had just moved to the United States. And so was talking about her own displacement, her own lack of power, her own powerlessness. Um, but that form repeats often within within her work. Right. Um, and you do see it in the windows and that's something that she had brought into it um, very purposely full, very purposeful, anyways, whatever that word is. She was very um, conscious of that, of including that. And she also refers to it at times as self-referential. So it's like the woman who needs for nothing, right? Like her feet don't even touch the ground. She is sort of, she fuels herself and her own ability and capability to continue. So there is also, I think, a positivity there that she sees and that she explores in that figure. Well, we, we took it as a protest, mm -hmm. as a affirmation, I guess is a better thing, that I am more than what others have looked at me and seen which is mm -hmm. cool. Really so, okay, then we have a question from Nagus that the Assyrian winged figures depiction reminds me of Egyptian pictorial traditions of figures. Is it known how much communications between artisans of the two regions, temporal as well as location, happen? So yeah, I mean, that's that's a great question. Um, we struggled a lot in this reinstallation because our Egyptian collection had been reinstalled in the Antiquities Gallery. Um, mm -hmm. And there was many moments where we thought, you know, a lot of these works would be just as relevant here. Like, where do you put and how do you silo cultures? You know, in a perfect world, the Antiquities Gallery would, would lead, you know, right in or be in parallel to this gallery because um, there are a lot of connections that you can make. And so I can absolutely see that. I think in particular, the way that the um, that the drawing has been created, it creates even more of a connection um, with some of those um, the Egyptian, Egyptian figural imagery. Um, so I love that. And I'd love to be able to make closer connections um, between the two collections over time. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to take my first school group past that, you know, because it's, it was always a, what in the world is that? And they had a hard time when I said it was huge and now they're not going to have any trouble yep. understanding what's going on with that. Yep, so, absolutely. Now it's always cool to see those discussions between um, cultures that happen. Mm -hmm. Um, another question is, are the sculptures made of stand, sandstone? And I agree with this question. Any remnants of pigments of color? 
Okay, so um, I'm not sure, Nuggets, which sculpture you're referring to. If it's the Assyrian um, winged figure, that one I believe is uh, either limestone or alabaster. Um, and then the Nabataean stone is a combination. Some of them are sandstone. Um, there's another stone as well. So there is a variety of, of stone types throughout the gallery, but in particular, the Assyrian one, I believe. Mm -hmm. it's okay. And is there, are, are there any colors involved? Because, you know, that was a big revelation about the Greek sculptures that were painted. Yeah, they would have, I think they would have been painted, absolutely, um, in that same tradition and same way. I'm trying to think of where we have some remnants of color. Um, there's not a lot. That is definitely something that wears away quickly over time. I think on the eagle, um, the eagle wrestling with serpent, I think that there is some remnant of pigment that we found there, um, as well as, that might be it, actually. Um, but what was really interesting is, um, Shazia's piece, um, the color palette that she chose, and this is another way that we sort of found ways to integrate past with present. Um, the color palette that we initially had, um, that we were working with her through, and the one that she chose was the color palette of the ancient world. We, we chose the colors, the pigments that we know would have been used at this time period and gave mm. her examples of that. And so she was drawing on those, some of the yellows and the greens um, mm. come from those particular examples. That's great. Anu um, said that Shazia also references her rootlessness and her ability to carry her roots with her and her agency in this role. Yep. Yeah. And yeah, and that's exactly what I was talking about, this self-referential, that actually is this power from within that's coming. Mm -hmm. And um, Nagas just came back with uh, her question was the not Nabataean. Nabataean ones. Okay, yeah. Most of them are sandstone, um, but there's two stones that you see. Um, even within the shrine, there's two different stones that you see. Um, I'm trying to remember. It's sandstone, and I'm going to, like, flip through the catalog. Um, <laughs> do pick up a catalog next time you're there as well. These are free um, in the space itself. Let's see if I can quickly figure out what the second stone is by looking at some of these captions. Limestone. Limestone and sandstone. The Nabataean ones. And so um, it's really interesting too, when you're um, on top of, of Tanor, when you're when you're at the temple site, um, you can see um, places like we don't know exactly where they quarried, but you can see the variety in the hills and you can see connections with color and places that you think that, that some of these things would have happened. There's also a, a sort of a, a, a darker, almost black stone that, uh, that you see sometimes in sculptures from the region and you can see from the top of town where you can see this part of the of the mountain, another hill that is that is made out of this black stone. And you're like, oh, that's really good. It, it's really fun. I have a question. Just because I found it absolutely fascinating to see all the lamps. And I do encourage everyone to see the lamps. And I know when I tour, there, there were one or two lamps out. And I try to get kids to... Um, to envision what life was like with no electric light that you could turn on at night and that you you had to have if you could afford it some kind of illumination at night so who who brought all those out dude i love that case um thank you that's um a, a case that's near and dear to my heart it's very hard to make lamps look interesting i kept on joking about this um i had a few different ideas of, of ways i wanted to display them initially i was calling it a lamp tree and i wanted to have like this like center like trunk and then oh. little mounts coming off of it that show the different lamps um we, we realized that um that would be very difficult and sort of unstable it'd be hard to get them to, to not shake as people walked past so we turned it into what I referred to as the Lamp Mayan Pyramid, which is where we have all of those plinths coming together. Um, yeah, and that's absolutely it. And I think that the interesting thing about the about lamps in general is that um, they were ubiquitous. You know, everybody had some version of these. And the ones that you see sort of at the back of the case, the more simple pinched lamps, yep. mm -hmm. um, those are ones that were affordable and that many different people had. Over time, you see the iconography changing, people spending a little bit more time in decorating these. Those would have been um, sort of um, for, for different communities, communities with a little bit more money. Um, but when you look at the archaeological reports of Kerbet et Tenor um, that Judith McKenzie brought together based on Nelson Glick's work, um, 
you see that, I mean, the place was littered with lamp fragments. A lot of ritual occurred at night at that temple and okay. everyone brought lamps. Like there's just littered with them. Like they're, those things, they break, they're easily, they're ceramic. Um, and you can, you can find them throughout the space. You could. They, Peg, I see your question, but I'd just like to jump on that one because it just hit me. Who could go to the temple? You know, so much of the artwork we have in our museums is for the, about the top 3% of the population, except for some of the religious things that maybe more commoners could see. So was the temple open to everyone in the community? So, I mean, we don't know um, exactly the, the ritual um, the ritual and devotional practices that occurred there. Um, but what we can see and understand, and, and there's like a certain amount of conjecture that, that happens when you're, when you're working in archeological work. Um, but what we, as far as we understand is that it was a pilgrimage site. So there were people traveling through, it was um, on a very important pilgrimage route. There was a lot of incense altars that were found there that referenced different styles in different places. So people brought offerings there. So there were a certain amount of people that were traveling through that space and pilgrims who were coming through um, and merchants set up probably nearby, right? Like on the roads moving into it and Curbita de Rio, which is another space um, that was probably a town, the closest town that functioned as, as the metropolis closest to this temple. Um, so there, there were a lot of people going through the space. There was likely though, um, sort of a, a, an inner space that only priests and certain people oh. would access. So we, you know, we believe that there are, there were sort of divisions in, um, in ways that you would access the temple. Okay. All right. Peg's uh, question is, and how did Cincinnati end up with this collection? Right. It's so fascinating. You know, like how does Cincinnati have this incredible connection? Um, we are now sister cities with Amman. We have been for um, several decades. And part of that is because of this. Um, so Dr. Nelson Glick, who was president, um, eventually president at Hebrew Union College, is an archaeologist based in Jerusalem. And in the 1930s, um, he is the one who um, led part of the dig in 1937 at the temple site. And so in archaeological practice in the early 20th century, it's very different from what it is today. But in archaeological practice in the early 20th century, um, you would have the host um, country. So in this case, the Department of Antiquities of Transjordan, often working with an external international archaeologist, and the archaeological remains would be divided between them between the two. So 50% would, would stay in the host country or the, the place where the site is, and 50% would travel with the international archeologist. So in this case, um, because Nelson Glick was associated with Hebrew Union College, it was brought back to Cincinnati. And in 1939, um, a consortium of individuals, including uh, people at the University of Cincinnati, people at the museum, people in our community more broadly, as well as at Hebrew Union College, raised funds so the museum could purchase the works and have them in the collection. So it's quite early, right, that it came here in 1939. Um, but yeah, it's been here since then. And it's been, you know, this incredibly, incredibly important, important collection that we're just so honored to, to be able to care for. The catalog um, that's in the gallery and free uh, talks a lot about how the collection en ended up here, has archeological photographs of the 1937 dig, as well as a biography on, uh, on Nelson Glick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the catalog is fantastic. It's a, it's a great reference work and I just love old photographs. So <laughs> it, it's, it's really fun, especially because Helen Glick was a huge part of the work there. And she yes. contributed a lot to the um, findings there, I guess, the best way to say it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. and she was uh, this incredible force in her own right, too, right? She was a, a doctor based here and incredibly intelligent and talented and, and did these great things in her career here, as well as, as well as joining her husband on these incredible adventures and digs. Right. Well, that's the last of the questions that had been posted. And um, I... And <laughs> Been watching the time because the Bengals game just started. Um, I know we've lost a bunch of people, so I suspect that they've gone off to um, to watch the game. And, and yeah, I hope. didn't manage to connect those two, did I, in my talk? That's okay. Well, who knew, right? Last week, we didn't know if we would 
the Bengals would be playing today. So yeah. that, yeah. that's where we are. That's where we are. Um, so uh, before we stop the recording, the public programs at the Cincinnati Art Museum are now canceled through the month of February. And our next program was to be Dr. Home Sung's demonstration of some objects that she has recently found. So I am going to be on the phone this week to see about rescheduling and hoping that the museum will be open in March for her to do this. Um, we definitely hope to have our sixth annual Asian art lecture a Dance in the Arts of India, which Ainsley has helped us organize with um, Michaela, Ka oof. Uh, Michaela Krishnan. Michaela Krishnan. Yeah, right. I was going to say Kashmir, but that doesn't work. <laughs> Krishna from New York City, a dancer. So they will be actually demonstrating dance and connecting it directly to artworks, which it's been canceled twice already. So I'm, I'm hoping we can we can do this on that one. So thank you everybody for joining us and those of you who have stayed. Um, if you wanna stay with any uh, questions for Ainsley, um, we are gonna stop the recording and have a little virtual um, reception for those of us who are non-Bengals fans. <laughs>